Look at how important Mimi is. Like, <laughs> imagine the invisible crowd. <laughs> Yeah. Hey, everybody. Looks like it's officially time to get started. Although, from what I can see, either not many people are here yet or this room is far too big. Uh, so, okay. So, I wonder if maybe we, well, we only have 90 minutes. Maybe we should uh, just get going since uh, probably a few of the things that we'll be doing today will take up a bunch of time. Okay. So welcome everybody to the second session for Mimi at uh, this at ITF 118. Um, that's very sweet. All right, here's uh, here's the note well as usual. So please, uh, if you haven't already, take a moment to uh, you know make yourself aware of the ITF's policies for stuff like intellectual property, code of conduct. Um, I think those are the big ones. Um, also, I believe there there ought to be one of those blue sheet. Uh, QR codes in the room. So if you, as you come in, please do scan that or otherwise use the participant tool to indicate that you're here. Um, and since this is a, a hybrid meeting, I want to remind everybody to uh, please identify yourselves when you come to the mic for, especially for the benefit of people who uh, are, are joining remotely and uh, don't necessarily know who's speaking. And of course, always uh, as much as possible, use the mic when speaking because otherwise people who aren't in the room can't hear you. Okay. Uh, Alyssa tells me we already have a note taker, so thank you very much, Ted. It's a, your help is extremely appreciated. Uh, next up, let's do the agenda bash. So uh, first, we're going to start by discussing um, a handful of open issues from the Vimy protocol, um, the, the, kind of carrying over from the discussion yesterday. So Travis and Conrad are going to take us through uh, a few of the important open issues uh, that have already been filed on, uh, on the documents GitHub repository. Then we're going to move on to talking about discovery. Uh, so first off, Alyssa is going to summarize some consensus points on the problem statement and uh, to some extent the shape of the solution. Then uh, we're going to hear from uh, Femi about interoperable private identity discovery and then Vittorio on discovery of Mimi service specific identifiers. Does anybody want to bash the agenda? Daniel, I saw you in the queue. Is that an accident? Okay, go ahead, Alan. Long walk to the mic. Yeah, just a quick one. Uh, uh, since uh, San Francisco, I have been uh, talking with a number of uh, people uh, about idea um, to have uh, informational uh, draft uh, related uh, to um, double ratchet to MLS migration. Uh, where some of uh, the uh, best practices uh, would be. Uh, put uh, into it and then uh, to make uh, people uh, more comfortable uh, doing it and uh, to get people to know uh, what it is uh, there. So uh, also Joel is uh, he's here from Wicker, us uh, from Wire that have this experience uh, uh, would be willing uh, there to uh, contribute and guide and uh, others if there is an interest uh, please uh, ping me uh, after the session and uh, would love. Uh, to talk to you about it. If uh, others uh, think that it absolutely doesn't make sense, not religious about it, uh, though I think uh, there is a quite a bit of uh, arguments uh, why it should be done. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Alan. Um, if there is no other agendas, uh, agenda bashes. Okay, let's get into the open issues. Um, Travis Conrad. So I'm going to share my screen with the uh, the GitHub issues, um, and then tell me which one you want to look at. I have I have the three that you uh, explained to us. Good stuff. Yeah, uh, I think thir thirty three is the first one, right? Uh, possibly. I think I sent the... Oh, 23. Sure. Tracking arbitrary state. Sure, yeah, let's start there. <laughs> uh, so yeah, um, there's kind of just three issues that we kind of want to take a look at, uh, time permitting, of course. Uh, first one being just tracking arbitrary state here. So currently in the Mimi protocol draft, we do not have uh, the ability to um, carry just informational state, like the room name, topic, that sort of stuff. 
so the proposal uh, for this, uh, as well as for all of the other issues we'll talk about today, is to um, implement something post-adoption. Uh, so the uh, design team will be suggesting that the documents get um, sent for adoption in the next few weeks, and we'll, we'll kind of take it from there. Uh, my comment from five hours ago there is essentially to have an mRoom state uh, event that will carry a state key and some arbitrary content blob, um, although there's an open question about whether that should be encrypted, how much of that should be encrypted, that sort of stuff. Um, so uh, feedback welcome in the live venue here. Richard? Yeah, so I don't think we can track quite arbitrary state, but it seems like, well, I mean, maybe we have an extension point where we can put arbitrary stuff in, but for things like room name that I think we'll, we'll want to have a fair bit of interoperability around, it seems like we, we need a slot. Um, you know, we, we should define at least like a basic profile for the state that has you know, the slots that we expect to be interoperable. Uh, and then maybe there's a way to put extra fields on that that different applications require and may not be, may have less interoperability. It's exactly to your point there, how arbitrary is arbitrary. Yeah, so like there is potentially some provider specific information that uh, might be useful. Um, what that information is might vary, um, but at least like the, like we can have some standardized stuff like the name uh, in particular, um, and then other stuff carried as, as per usual, I think. Mm -hmm. I can't see the queue from here. Oh, Matthew, okay. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. Matrix. Like, go ahead. Um, I would have thought it, would, it really shouldn't be very controversial oh, hi, Ryan. <laughs> um, to say that um, we should support arbitrary, like any kind of key value um, data on a given conversation, because we can't predict what features might need to be interoperated um, between the various different platforms here. So if somebody goes and says, hey, I want an avatar on this conversation. Somebody wants to give it a topic. Somebody wants to give it a description. Somebody wants to give it a name. All of these other things, we can provide a kind of baseline profile for common interop, but having the extensibility like you get in XMPP or Matrix to go and decorate these conversations with additional data just feels like table stakes. And I'm kind of surprised that um, uh, it's even sort of up for debate. Raphael. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so since the, uh, the question was already brought up um, about encryption, so I think that is a desirable property in some instances, not necessarily in all of them. So ideally, the design should be flexible in the way that um, it may or may not be um, a strict format for the content, but that whether that is encrypted or not, um, should actually be completely untangled. So obviously we don't know how we would deal with key management here. Um, that is something we would have to look into. Um, but keeping the door open to being able to encrypt it uh, would be a good thing, I think. TKG. Uh, Daniel Khan Gilmore. So um, I'm obviously think that, that we should be able to handle uh, encrypted shared state for the room. Um, I want to point out that uh, from Matthew's comment, the idea of having separate, you know, a, a flexible, extensible namespace for different platforms does seem reasonable, but to the extent that shared room state is encrypted, if we do not encrypt the keys, uh, that is the name, uh, sorry, there's lots of different meanings of the word key here, right? So if this is a flexible option where you can say, well, this is the avatar and this is the name and this is the motto or something like that, those are sort of named, uh, if, if the names themselves are not encrypted, that could itself be a problem. So I would like to encourage us to think um, about having an encrypted bundle that itself may have within it some sort of keyed uh, or indexed values, instead of saying, well, we'll have, you can have arbitrary names and then those individual things could be encrypted. Um, it's better to have one blob so that the servers can't see what types of metadata the group has decided to annotate among themselves. Conrad? 
Uh, yeah, Conrad Kobrok. Um, so I generally agree. I think it's a good thing that we can store additional room states. And the way um, we've done this in, in MLS is to ensure that everyone agrees what's in that room state so that there's no, you know, no one, not one person think the picture is the room picture and the other one thinks it's a picture of a different sort um, just because it's in a, in, in, a, in a weird field or something. So there should be agreement about what's in there. And regarding the encryption, we... I think this is generally a quite a hard problem because while we do have the MLS group underlying uh, the group that you know um, allows people to agree on key material, that key material is changing from epoch to epoch, and thus you either have to re-encrypt um, so that people who left the group can no longer decrypt the blob, and people that joined the group can and, uh, so can can then uh, decrypt the blob and re-encrypt if necessary. So we either need to re-encrypt the blob every time we change the epoch. Or we need to come up with a key rotation scheme outside of MLS that gives us some degree of post-compromise security and forward secrecy. Um, I think that's just generally a hard problem that we should, if we want this, that we need to solve. Hi, Rowan May. Um, so we have the we have the room a bunch of room state already where we have the policy. The participant list, um, we could easily add this kind of information to, you know, to the policy document, or we could attach it as another kind of state and treat it in the same way that we treat participant lists. But I think that this is one of the you know, this is the kind of feature that we want to have an existence proof that we could go and do something with this later. And I think it's clear that there are two or three different places, two or three different ways that we could do this. We could do it in the policy document, adjacent to the policy document. We could do it in an event. All three of those things are things that we could add later because we have extensibility hooks for each of those three things. So. I would say, let's please punt on this until after we've made progress where we can get the mandatory functionality working. And then we can come back and revisit this. And I think there are, there are several things in that category, many of which I would like to revisit and want to, to get, you know, to, to, for us to, to show how to do. But I, I, want, I really want us to stay focused and try to get the, the stuff that is absolutely essential first. Thanks. Uh, just for clarity, Rowan, uh, this is a discussion for stuff that's happening after adoption. Uh, we don't plan to uh, send this in for as part of the adoption call in the documents. Ack. Uh, Jonathan Lennox, I just, I feel like this seems similar to the, the, the thing we were talking about at the previous session about the associated files, and I'm wondering if we can use the same mechanism. But you know, Rohan's caveat applies to both of those things. So. Hey, Benjamin here. Um, so I wonder if actually this is not like more of an MLS problem, like this is a me problem in the sense that we have discussed multiple times. We actually didn't attend that problem in in MLS, but the we, we have this need for recurrent uh, secure storage mechanism that works with the key derivation from MLS, more or less, and. Uh, there are a few designs that we actually uh, took forward when we did MLS that we didn't push in the spec because we didn't have actually time to, you know, flush the, the, those things out. So I wonder if whether this should be involved in Mimi or if we should, like, that's a discussion for the MLS authors, I guess, to build this generic mechanism that actually explo exploits the internals of MLS to do that. Uh, and make sure that it provides what we need for 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 me. It's just like a generic group state mechanism. A group storage thing where, you know, sometimes you have the use case of you want to add something to a backup that will be uh, available for the people in the group at that time. And at, after some point, you remove someone. You still want this encrypted backup to work for the people that were in the group at that time, and not for the future people. And that's where you know MLS gives you the PCS through the exporter. But I think there is something we can do here to make this quite nice at the MLS level. Uh, that would be like pluggable for for Mimi. Thanks. 
Martin. Um, I just wanted to respond to Rowan's suggestion to punt this um, further down the road, um, which I think overlaps also with Benjamin's proposal there to some extent. But it feels like we really should have a generic way of describing metadata about a room. Whether that's done at the MLS layer or done at the MIMI layer is um, debatable. But if we ignore the requirement to be able to describe things, we end up with, say, the policy stuff being its own very domain-specific thing with some sort of domain-specific language um, for, for that, which is not aligned with the generic key value mechanism. We can end up with two completely different things running around. And then, yeah, perhaps we have a different one for attachments and a different one time and time again. It feels like we might want to design this more proactively to have it as a building block that we can use. Richard. Yeah, I, I have a little bit of a different question. Um, folks seem to be have some enthusiasm about encryption, um, but it's not clear to me um, kind of who this encryption would be designed to protect against. Uh, it seems to me like the, the sort of stuff that's in this room state is likely stuff that's intended to be visible to the providers involved in the conversation. Um, so I guess the question is, do we, do we intend for this stuff to be confidential, the, the general stuff in this, in this room state to be confidential from the providers? Um, and if so, then, then encrypting makes sense, but if not, then I don't really get the point of the encryption. I'm going to lock the queue. So if you want to be in the queue, get in the queue. Uh, Jonathan Hoyland. So uh, I obviously, I don't think it's a good idea to try and uh, design crypto while standing on one foot. But is has the idea of using something like proxy re-encryption where the server, that or the service provider rather, can re-encrypt the data under a different key without ever seeing the data? based on a token issued by a member of the group. Uh, has that been considered as the mechanism for this, or are we just going to do some magic? I believe the type of encryption that we're kind of thinking here is exclusively MLS related, um, either as some form of message and then somehow negotiating keys, uh, which is also an open question there. Um, particularly when you are dealing with something like the room name, which would be useful on an invite or an ad, um, but the target might not be participating in the conversation yet. Um, I'm not sure what the working group's, uh, I guess, ability to explore other avenues for encryption would be on this sort of stuff. Yeah, because the, the issue would be, you know, clients might not have the processing power or battery or whatever to fully decrypt and then re-encrypt all the state on every epoch, but they could issue a light token and then some processing could be done by a blinded server. Anyway. Rowan, go ahead. Oh, no, Richard is next, sorry. Richard. Rowan, you're next. That was still. Okay, um, so I'm going to say again, we have no use. We have no formal definition of what we want to do. We have no requirements. We have no use case. Why are we talking about a mechanism? Uh, as a stepping back, as a meta issue, I don't think that we should be talking about these post adoption issues at all when we have 18 open issues in the in the repo for the protocol document. Maybe it would be a better use of our time if we go through some of those, if we pick a handful of those and actually have a subset of discussion where we have real requirements and real use cases already. Uh, the use case here is definitely we need to communicate a room name somehow. Uh, this is also on the protocol document. But if we have a suggestion for another issue to look at, I'm happy to explore it. We do have a few sort of selected already. Um, but you know, the more fundamental, the better. Yeah, clarify fan out, for example, maybe uh, refactor invites, add, um, add authorization, you know, these are shape of policy. These are all pretty fundamental issues, which I think could benefit from some discussion maybe. So 
Yeah, so, I mean, this, we decided yesterday we we're gonna go through some issues. I would hope that the design team could like collectively <laughs> try to steer this a little bit. Uh, these were the ones that got sent to us, these three, um, 23, 33, and 31. Um, so, you know, trying to like defer to the design team about what they wanna talk about, and that's why we're talking about these. We have like 15 minutes left. I suspect we will only get through one more. So, like, you, you tell us which one you wanna to move to next. And I think we have one more person in the queue. Uh, let's hear from that other person first. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I agree, of course, with uh, Ron that maybe there are more pressing issues, but um, since I'm that slot now. So uh, to answer your question, Richard, I think we need a, a crisp definition of a threat model here. And the intuition is that it is the same that we also apply for and to an encryption, meaning that um, we don't want the operator in the first place to be able to see some potentially sensitive data. Of course, it's debatable how much of the data is actually sensitive and how much of it is needed uh, in practice. But it's, it's always a good starting point to uh, think about uh, encrypting everything and then see what we have to have in the clear for functional uh, reasons. And um, as to the concrete mechanism, uh, simply because you brought it up, Jonathan, I think uh, we can use MLS as a starting point simply because we have that as a mechanism for key negotiation, but that doesn't mean that we couldn't go further and do proxy re-encryption, for example, if we think that that is an adequate uh, solution to the problem. Um, but we should really punt that discussion until we really understand threat model and, and how what functionality we want to have around that state um, and, and how we want to protect it. Okay, so which one are we moving to next? <laughs> uh, from my perspective, I would suggest that we talk at least about fan out and possibly issue 33, which I believe was the next one on the list, um, where we start talking about the routing between different servers, like whether or not they can go directly or if they have to go through the hub. Um, this was previously discussed, I believe, in the context of the working group, but it might have been slightly outside of it, um, where we preferred that things go through the hub, um, meaning everything, including requesting key packages from another follower. Uh, but the protocol document currently doesn't do this. Uh, that would be my suggestion for where to kind of go from here. Cube's open again. While people join the queue, can I ask the person presenting to increase the font size about four times? Thank you. Hi, it's Rowan. Um, whoa, <laughs> maybe three times. <laughs> yeah, you see, you can only achieve so much, I'm afraid. You'll have to do your best. Um, Oh crap. <laughs> now, I'm, now I'm working the font size in the wrong window. Uh, okay, so uh, I, I generally agree that if you need to go and talk to, if you need to get a key package to add someone to a room, uh, to add them directly, that getting that, from, that getting that through the hub is a good thing to do. Um, but I don't think we want to say that you must do that. Uh, and we have other ways of other methods of get, of doing ads that involve, you know, like you have another, we have another open issue for knocks and in knocks, the person who, when somebody answers a knock, uh, you know, when somebody knocks, they may provide a key package. Um, so we don't want to preclude other things like that. But I think that providing that this is the, the sort of the default way that you should go about getting the key package and saying that that's going through the hub, I think that that's sensible guidance. Uh, hopefully that makes sense. So this is um, something that we've got wrong on Matrix um, historically, where you end up with two different um, traffic patterns for messages versus um, 
what the equivalent of key packages in the double ratchet world in the whilst the matrix the events can go or the messages themselves can go full mesh the keys um, can only um, or can go transitively the keys have to go direct so you can end up with horrible situations where if you don't have full mesh connectivity you can get the messages without having the keys and i think there is scope for a similar problem here if you encourage people to get the keys directly from the source and it turns out they can't route to them then uh, there's no guarantee that two parties are actually connected in the full mesh here particularly in a dma kind of world where you might have two massive uh, messaging um, silos who have gone and interoperated with one another but you might have somebody else who only interoperates with one of them they might not physically be able to connect through at an ip level to the um, other party so i think um, you do have to have the ability to fetch via the hub whether you do that by default or not um, uh, is well i'd probably agree with ryan Uh, I guess to add a question for the queue, um, do we have the opportunity for the followers to directly communicate with each other? Um, in the past, we've sort of asked the question of whether or not there is even, particularly in a DMA sense, a legal capability for those servers to communicate. Um, like they might be barred or prevented um, due to lacking legal agreement. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't design around that, <laughs> right? Like, I think we should figure out what the protocol needs are and for like generic interoperable system um, as opposed to constraining ourselves based on that, right? Go ahead. Hi, this is Daniel. Um, <clears throat> can somebody who understands this problem better than me talk about this uh, additional authentication mechanism that's needed a bit more. I'm not sure that I understand why routing the key packages through the hub creates an additional authentication mechanism. Or creates the need for one. Okay, sounds like I'm not the only person in the room who doesn't understand that. Uh, I was gonna say, Conrad, if you're out there, I think this was uh, one of the to-do comments that showed up in one of the PRs. <laughs> Uh, okay, I think what I was referring to here was the requirement for um, uh, for um, the owner of the key package, so not the person who fetches the key package, but the person whose key package it is, to be able, or the provider to be able to say, or to check, hey, this uh, requester is not, to authenticate the requester, so who is requesting it, and then make a policy decision based on that fact, so... I don't know, Alice allows only her friends to fetch her key packages, something like that. And um, for all, I think for all the other relevant events, uh, quote unquote, that we have until now, there is a, we're more or less using MLS, so there's authentication built in. So if we have something that fetches key packages that is not MLS, um, we have to build some sort of, yeah, authentication into a signature base probably. I think that's what I meant. Okay, but if it is MLS, then we don't need an additional authentication mechanism. The hub can simply act as a as a um, I, sort of IP transit that just passes the MLS messages across to the remote server. True, but if it is MLS, it has to happen within a group because in MLS, all authentication, except for the authentication of key packages, you know, all, all messages are tied to a group except maybe the key packages. So, uh, yeah, I'm not sure how what. How, how we would map that to an MLS mechanism, fetching key packages. Okay. I, I think I, I still don't understand the problem, let alone what the possible solutions are. So um, it'd be great if somebody wanted to take a stab at writing a clear explanation of what this problem is on the list. I can take a stab at that if, if uh, and yeah, well, I can, I can try to propose a solution if, some, if no one else has, uh, wants to take this. Sounds good, thank you. Cool. You wanna do one more? No, okay. 
think we're going to end it there. I do want to just take one minute to talk about the, what's going to happen after this with this draft because of the message that was sent saying there's going to be no updates before we do the adoption call. Um, are you guys going to be like processing these issues in GitHub and trying to close them out and fold changes into the GitHub version? Or it's literally just like we expect nothing and then you are asking us to do an adoption call in like a couple of weeks after people had time to read it? Uh, we might make changes to the GitHub side, but we do not plan to publish a version prior to adoption. Yeah. So, uh, if I could step in real quick. Uh, Alyssa, when we were chatting about this um, plan before, I think the, the idea was we would have a little bit of time here, get any feedback from the working group that um, that might uh, we might fold in uh, as a, a quick next revision. Um, I think we had some useful discussion here, but I'm not sure we got into any actionable changes. So I think uh, probably the next th thing to do is to you know allow some time for folks to read and and uh, have the adoption call on, on the document as it exists today. Obviously, we'll keep working in GitHub and, and process that then after on on the adopted document. Okay, so the task for the people in the working group is to uh, read and digest the existing document and also to comment on the GitHub issues. In particular, like if you think any of them are um, blockers in terms of if, if they were decided a particular way, you don't think we can adopt this document. Um, that That's very useful information for us before we go to the adoption call. Good. Okay, great. Thank you, Travis. We are going to move on to the discovery uh, section of the agenda, and I'm just going to talk for a couple of minutes about where I think we got to last time in terms of um, points of agreement, building from the, the two interims that we had on this topic. Um, and then we'll turn it over to the solution presentations from Femi and Giles and then Vittorio. Okay. So just in terms of the framing of the problem, um, we've had a lot of you know, confusion about terminology. I'm sure we will, this is not gonna clear it all up, but it's trying to go some, some way along the path. So how, do we, how are we framing this problem? This is a problem of, of user discovery. Um, so uh, we have service specific identifiers um, that identify a unique user within a single service provider. We have service independent identifiers like phone numbers and email addresses that identify a unique user independent of any service. And messaging providers want to be able to assert mappings from SIIs to SSIs so that we can actually exchange messages between, um, between different providers. When we spoke last time, uh, sort of came to an agreement that we anticipate there being a large number of messaging providers that could exist in this interoperable uh, system. And clients or providers that are acting on behalf of clients want to be able to discover which SSIs map to a given SII. So a user using their client wants to be able to input an SII um, and figure out which SSIs are mapped. In general, clients or and the providers acting on their behalf um, are unlikely to be trusting uh, all other messaging providers to um, correctly assert the SII to SSI mapping. So it might be the case that between any two providers, they do trust each other, but we're anticipating a world where um, some of them do not trust each other. Um, and they assume that some, some providers will be um, you know, potentially maliciously asserting false SII to SSI mappings. You can go to the next one, Tim. So what we talked about last time was really when, when people were talking about discovery, um, there's actually two distinct sub-problems that are involved and require solution likely. Um, one is an authentication problem and one is a distribution problem. So in terms of, Richard, do you wanna jump in before I continue? Nope, end the slide. Oh, okay. Um, so in terms of the authentication problem, um, what we're trying to solve for here is that clients or, or their providers um, need to be able to trust these mappings and when we think about the shape of this part of the problem, it starts to look a lot like a PKI. Um, so you can, I think in the, we had this term before discovery provider, which was pretty nonspecific, but if we think about the authentication half of the problem, you can imagine a mapping authority, um, which is doing this authentication and um, 
it has a lot of the same kind of properties and, and constraints and, um, and threat model as CAs do in a, in a PKI. Um, and in terms of the kind of separability or convergence of roles, um, if you think about it this way, then it implies that there, will, there could be an option for messaging providers to be their own mapping authorities or for some messaging providers to use third-party mapping authorities. So um, we are likely to want to have the option of, of either of those models. The distribution side of the problem, and if, if you assume that you have authenticated mappings, um, then clients or providers that are acting on their behalf need an efficient way to um, query the mappings. So they need to be able to obtain these mappings from someplace. Um, and now you have uh, another different role, which is the distribution point role, separate from the mapping authority. Um, since the mappings are authenticated, then you could distribute them in any manner of ways, and it depends on you know, how you want to optimize for privacy and scaling and all these other things that we'll talk about in the solution proposals and that we talked about a little bit last time too. Um, and again here, it could imply that messaging providers are the distribution points. Um, and it's sort of open question of whether you need any other model besides the messaging providers being the distribution points. So this is sort of like the breakdown of the problem I think that we got to by the end of the last um, discussion in terms of conceptually, not just thinking about discovery as one monolithic thing, but these two separate uh, problems to address. Richard, go ahead. Yeah, so, so thanks for that summary, Alyssa. I think this captures things really clearly. I just wanted to, to pull out one point here that is in bold on this slide, but uh, the, the font makes it maybe not super clear. I uh, think uh, an Im important point to keep in mind in this taxonomy is that this, 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 this division of labor between authentication and distribution means we have kind of two sorts of actors here, mapping authorities who are trusted to assert the validity of mappings and mapping distribution points who actually hand out the information. Um, so I think that's, those are the things that are, are distinct and as, as the previous slide may overlap, um, but those are distinct roles. Um, I think this is an important point for our design here. Thanks. So I think people probably saw on the list, like I didn't actually put this into the slide until this morning. So the presentations that we have, I think you know, they're still gonna use the term discovery provider, um, but hopefully we can think through the separation of the roles um, as people are presenting. And I think it'll, it'll be pretty obvious um, which, which half of the problem we're talking about at which point. If there's no other questions or comments on the summary or anyone wants to argue with the summary of where we are thus far, um, we can start in on the presentations. John, go ahead. Sorry, uh, John Peterson, person who did not make any of the design team calls. Sorry. So, so we don't have a like, design team for this one. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. So, is there is there like a document planned or some kind of successor to the previous requirement document like that describes this that we're going to try to get consensus on in this group? Because I love this and think this this is a beautiful thing, and we should articulate and try it and then try to figure out what kinds of things we need to build to go with that? Or are we expecting this is gonna end up being integrated into one or more of the drafts that we're gonna be discussing coming up? Do I hear you volunteering to write a requirements document, John? I believe there is a requirements document already. Uh, uh, the Jonathan Rosenberg yes. document. Ah, perhaps we could speak to him. Is he around? Huh. He's here. Um, well, I am here. I would be more than happy to fold this concept into the document. Okay. I mean, yeah, it's just really, so, I mean, we're looking still then to have something like this as guidance. Then we're going to look for things that are this shaped from, you know, proposals that are going forward. Is that the overall work plan? Yeah. I mean, I think we've kind of been pushing forward on both fronts just because due to limited cycles and on various parts. Okay. Um, but I do think uh, we, we need to have the requirements agreed. Um, we might okay. continue to kind of ping pong back and forth, but yes. Fantastic. Thanks. Giles, do you have a question? Uh, no, I was trying to share my slides. I, I'm not okay, familiar great. with how this works. Okay, I think it's between you and Tim. I think Tim can do it or you can do it. It's up to you guys. Yeah, uh, we're ready to move on to the presentation. We can give it a shot. Yeah. Um, How do I share my slides? Sorry. Oh, I see. Okay. 
So if you wanted to do it, there's a there's an icon at the bottom in your little bottom um, row for sharing. That's right. I'll, I'll just let... like Tim is doing it. Maybe. Yeah. All right. Thanks. So yeah, Tim's got it ready. Um, so just uh, referencing what Alyssa just in, introduced, this is mainly focused on the distribution part of the problem. Um, we don't think that the <clears throat> authentication problem part of the problem is a new problem. It's, as Alyssa said, it's kind of PKI, very much PKI shaped and we don't think there's much really required there other than, you know, using SSL um, most of the time. Uh, there will be, if, if we have third party uh, discovery providers or uh, authentication providers, might might be something needed there. But I think the biggest, uh, I, I'm not saying it's not a problem, I'm just saying Jonathan, I'm just saying the, the harder problem is the distribution problem. Um, so that's what we're focusing on. Um, uh, next slide, please. Uh, so I, I think there's pretty broad agreement on the problem statement. Uh, at least we, we strongly agree that uh, the problem is take an SSI and map it to an S, um, sorry, take, yeah, take an SSI, SII and map it to an SSI uh, and preserve the pri user's privacy at the same time. Um, we had a lot of discussion in the, not a working group, but uh, the, the team that was working on this uh, about like who are the actors and what should be uh, what should be hidden from from which actors um, and so next slide please um, I'm going to start with a discussion uh, of how we how we see the the threat actors in this model um, so. <clears throat> On the, there, in this diagram, there are three clients, um, <clears throat> Alice, Bob, and Carol. We've included a third client because uh, we want to cover the case where you have two clients uh, who are using the same front end messaging provider. For example, two clients using WhatsApp, um, <clears throat> both using WhatsApp. Uh, and then there is the sender messaging platform. So I, if I want to send a message, I send it to my front end first, and that potentially handles all of the ongoing uh, distribution <coughs> and discovery for me. Uh, and then on the right-hand side, there is the recipient mess messaging platform. But... Um, it's important to note here that um, this is not necessarily somebody that you might you're actually going to send a message to. Um, so that's why we call it the potential recipient messaging platform, uh, because I think the the privacy requirements are different uh, between somebody that you discover and never send a message to and somebody that you discover and you actually do send a message to because the latter is going to learn uh, your S I your SII. Um, and so there's no point in hiding it from, from somebody that you are going to send a message to uh, or the platform that's distributing the message. Um, and uh, I'll go into this in more detail, but then the th the third <clears throat> um, actor here is a potential um, third party <clears throat> uh, discovery provider, and here I'm to Elisa's point. I'm talking about the 
uh, distribution <clears throat> part of the problem. Um, uh, so that is a potential par party who's unrelated to either the sender and the receiver who um, can answer mapping questions. All right. Um, next slide, please. Uh, the requirements uh, are uh, have been pretty stable, but um, at, at a high level. Um, but it, I, I think the the most important one of these three is that the none, none of the discovery service providers should learn the users the querying. Uh, sorry, the the SII that the user is querying unless they are sending or receiving a message to the user that's being queried. Um, <clears throat> and uh, yeah, the other two are not, not so important. Uh, next next slide, please. All right, so, so here are the details on what how we think the requirements break down by the threat actors. Um, and <clears throat> I want to spend a fair amount of time on this slide. Uh, so uh, as, as I said uh, in the previous slide, we think that uh, the most, the, the, the minimum privacy requirement is that you should hide the SII from all actors except the sender uh, platform and the recipient platform. And that means the actual recipient, not uh, potential recipients. Um, and <clears throat> this might seem like a theoretical issue that, you know, I'm going to, uh, I, I want to discover the endpoint, uh, the, the S, SI of a user that I'm going to send a message to. So what's the problem with, why do we need to hide it from potential recipients? Um, but actually, if you look at the way these things work in practice, um, and why we need to hide it, hide it from potential recipients and senders. Um, if you look at these, how these things work in practice, Typically, a user would have a, a large set of um, contacts, and the sender platform uh, would <clears throat> uh, try to perform discovery or reachability for all of those contacts. So, like, who in your contacts can I send a message to on my platform or another platform? <clears throat> and um, and and they might you might only ever want to send a message to a very small fraction of uh, the the s uh, I, i's in your contact list so <clears throat> this is not really a theor theoretical problem um uh let's see um so we uh we uh <clears throat> we think that the the minimum pri privacy requirements are hiding uh, from any any actor who does not either send or receive a message. Um, all right, uh, moving on to the next slide. We have a, some people in the queue, so. Oh yeah, uh, let's go ahead. Go ahead, Ben. Hi. Is there uh, an assumption here that the uh, that the SSI for a given SII is public? Um, more more on that uh, later. Okay, not exactly. It's it's <clears throat> it's um, public, but potentially rate limited. So it's the assumption is that it's public to a, an individual querier but that service providers might not want to expose their entire uh, list of subscribers. 
Okay, uh, that, that seems like a very weak privacy uh, goal. Um, well, uh, like the, if you look at declaring that, like it shall be public to the world that like anybody who knows my phone number can figure out whether I have an account on every one of the services where I might have an account, um, you know, reveals quite a lot about you know my habits, especially if we're talking about a long tail of chat services that are essentially specific to particular types of interest or communities. Yeah, I, I understand that. But <clears throat> if you look at the way this works in the all current messaging providers uh, adopt that model that it is essentially public. So we, we did have a lot of discussion about that point. Um, uh, I, I, don't, I don't really agree with that. Uh, I think that there are lots of, of messaging systems that are essentially uh, username based. And, uh, you know, if you don't know my username on that platform, then you can't find out if I use it. Yeah, but, but the point of this is you, you really do the registration or the hot path if you want other users to discover you. So if you are really privacy conscious, you don't want to be discovered in those other platform, you shouldn't establish your credential for discovery. Go ahead, John. Yeah, uh, John Peterson. Yeah, I, I have been getting increasingly confused and I'm now convinced I really don't understand this at all. So for, first of all, I mean, you're, you're not hiding SIIs, I mean, you're, no, when are you hiding SIIs as opposed to SSIs? SIIs are, are front doors. They're public, affecting like phone numbers, and they can just be enumerated, right? Um, like, so, I, yeah. I, I, and, but, but more to the point, I mean, you know, even the processes I'm aware of and thinking of messaging systems here are like SMS and MMS, right, which are relatively prominent messaging platforms at this forum. You, know, you have like some kind of public identifier that does end up being converted into some sort of private identifier behind the scenes. The thing, the way that those get hidden from users is simply by virtue of the fact that that transformation happens while the message is in flight. There is no like actual like discovery that you do as a round trip before you then go on to contact an, SI, an SSI, right, for the entity in question. So, I mean, I, 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 I'm not sure how well this maps onto what all messaging provider systems do, and this needs to go back to a much more fundamental discussion about what the requirements are and what we're trying to I, do. I think maybe there's a misunderstanding here that I am not talking about hiding the SII from the requester, or talking. we're talking about hiding the SII from that, the, a, the that a user is querying from right. the discovery yeah, for, provider. For what you had is the discovery service, which again, because of the intervention, I think that Melissa described at the beginning of this, I think is an incredibly useful one, where we're going to differentiate between like who is the authority that tells you what the mappings are and what are the distribution points from which you can achieve it. I think these, the kinds of privacy properties that are on the slide don't align with that either. And if that's our model, we will be looking at a very different set of privacy questions. This is Daniel Gilmore. Um, I'm at least as confused as John and maybe in slightly different ways. Um, I don't think that the number itself is the privacy thing that we want to hide. What we want to hide is the relationship between the number and the various people that are involved. Furthermore, we want to hide the fact, we, I think there are privacy pro properties that we should be thinking about, about who is looking up what numbers. Because the social yes. graph is in both directions, right? It's not just which account does this phone number have on this service, it's who is looking up this phone number on this service. So again, I'm also, I, this doesn't represent, this slide at least that, that I'm looking at doesn't represent the, the requirements that I would think of when I think about the privacy properties um, in terms of trying to avoid leakage of the social graph uh, across multiple federated systems. Yeah, it's I mean, this is, problem, but this is not, this doesn't represent what I think the problem is. This is one half of the problem. You, you have to, uh, there's the querier and who you're querying for. Uh, hiding the identity of the querier is a IP privacy problem. 
uh, as in I, IP address, not intellectual property. And hiding, hiding the this this is about hiding the SII of the queried party. And you you need both sides of it, but this this is kind of the novel problem, and the the other side of it is um, more of a known problem. It's not just an I, IP address, but it's the uh, you know it's either an IP address or an. Uh, an account identifier or but what i'm saying is it's a it's a known problem and so i'm focusing more on this side of it like the address of the uh, the the sii of the party that you're querying which is one side of the social graph so we we did talk about the other side of this problem a little bit in the last interim right and then this is what led to the discussion of OHTTP or whatever, how do you proxy some of the things? Um, so I, I think for the purposes of this presentation, it helps to just like be clear about which part of the problem you're speaking to. Yeah. Okay. Um, move on to the next slide. Um, so I, I think we've already covered this one. Um, I, one point I wanted to add is that uh, one objection we've had to uh, hiding the queried SII from the discovery provider is that it prevents you from uh, doing spam pre prevention. But uh, I want to point out that um, this is a process that will happen prior to uh, sending a message and so it doesn't it doesn't prevent uh, it doesn't stand in the way of abuse prevention uh, for message sending uh, next slide please um, so this is uh, to previous question. Uh, some of the couple of the non requirements I want to point out is uh, we think that hiding the SII to serve it to SSI mapping uh, is not a privacy goal here. Um, and obviously, that will, I'm sure, will continue to be a debate, um, <clears throat> but. All, merge, all major service providers, uh, and I, I'd love to hear about more about service providers who don't do this, but uh, uh, all, all ma major phone number based <coughs> service providers uh, make this mapping uh, public, but not publicized today. Um, so um, it we should support <clears throat> uh, scraping um, prevention, prevention, but <clears throat> I do not think it's uh, feasible to try to make these uh, um, private. Uh, Jonathan? Or yeah. I'm Sorry, I'm, I think I'm first. Um, I again, I think we, we're going around in circles a bit on this. I I think there's a lot of nuance, and we're getting confused because we say it's either private or not, and we make it sort of a boolean thing when that's not the case. And and you sort of even hinted some of the nuance that's really important here, which is, for example, I, I strongly believe we have a requirement to prevent what I've been calling an enumeration process, where it is possible for an untrusted entity to gain the full list of all of the SIIs that are owned by a particular messaging provider. I believe that is a complete and utter non-starter to any solution to this problem. And so that's one dimension of this. Um, there, uh, there are probably also requirements like rate limiting. Like I don't want one messaging provider to be able to 
retrieve more than a volume of these mappings that is appropriate for the user base they support. So again, I, I don't know whether or not this, that spans lines probably between rate limiting and privacy, um, but I, I do think we need to get crisp about exactly what we're trying to do here. Go ahead, John. Yeah, I'm just trying to understand in bullet one. I mean, are you suggesting that like today, Apple publicly makes available the mapping between my telephone number and my iCloud account, which is what makes my reachability in iMessage work? Yes. Is that is that true? As in, if you type the phone number into iMessage and it goes through, then you are confirmed that the other user has an iCloud, has, oh, a, it, has it an gives, iMessage account. Does it give my iCloud account identifier, which is what actually routes that to, then to my laptop and my iPad and everything else? I, I don't believe that's the case. I, th I, th I, think it, I think you can basically get it. At that yeah. Point. <laughs> So I, is, is that accessible to, to people within the iMessage app or is it accessible to say like a random Android user? Yeah, is it, is it, is it I, I mean, I, I would believe that it is exposed to someone with whom I've established a mutual contact, but it's not that you can like go to apple.com and put in a telephone number and get somebody's like iMessage, uh, or I'm sorry, iCloud like email address from that, right? Um. I do not think they have a way to prevent uh, a client from retrieving that mapping. Okay. Um, um, same for Signal, same for WhatsApp, same for Google Messages. Departing from this from the assumption that any SII can be publicly converted you know, by anyone into an SSI. I think, yeah, to, as Jonathan just put it a moment ago, it's a non-starter. That's what we're trying to do here. I think we're, we're crazy. Um, I'm going to ask Mallory to go before me because she might say something better than I wanted to. Mallory Nodal, CDT, thank you. I don't, I don't know. The, I, so we're talking about how to, be interoperable. And I can tell you that there are going to be providers of these applications that are going to be as private as, private as possible for their users, and they're not going to give you anything if you ask, unless you have exactly the identifier. That's a, that could be a feature. And so I guess I don't, I, it seems to me that if we're trying to um, interoperate these things, we need to be thinking about the bare minimum, not creating an opportunity to go, to go beyond that. I, I don't know if that's clear, but um, this just feels like we're establishing like a range of things that could be shared. And I'd like to think about, um, you know, bare, bare minimum, like what's the most, um, the I, most minimum thing. That's when you say, when you say, uh, unless they have the identifier, isn't that the SII? Um, but it's different for, I mean, those services are not all the same. So I guess. I'm going to think about it some more. Hi, Rowan May. So I, what, I've, what I've heard in some of these previous discussions, including one of the interims, was uh, basically an assertion from, I think, Giles, one of the things that you said that uh, about how the current systems work is that uh, you can get this, you can, you can get a handful of these mappings at a time right now from any of these services that there's basically like, that there's a, there's a leakage of this information, but that it's impractical to use this leakage to collect a, you know, a, a complete map. And I also heard Ecker say, that's impossible. You can always generate enough, enough identities or enough uh, queriers that you, can, that you can collect. You know, basically give me, give me a, leaky, uh, a, a leaky system and I can recreate a full map. Now, I don't know which one of you is right about this, but my point is that I don't think that the current state of things 
is what we want. So I don't think that this level of leakiness is the level of leakiness that we want in a system that we define in Mimi. Um, and I actually, um, but if, if you think that this level is acceptable, that I think that we wanna have like a very crisp set of what, the, what we think the privacy characteristics of, of that are, and then we can evaluate, you know, is that true? Uh, do we get those properties? Uh, does, that, does that seem reasonable to you, Giles? Yeah, I mean, I'm absolutely not opposed to trying to figure out how we would solve privacy of the mapping. Uh, I do think it's very hard to achieve in a way that's usable and feasible, but I'm not I'm not opposed to it. So can I can I just jump in for one second before you go? Um, so I think there's like there's a few different concepts that are getting mixed together. So just for clarification, um, I think this what we're really talking about here is the is the service reachability, not which is potentially separate from the mapping. Um, I think the prior discussion about this was really driven by the service reachability, i.e. Today, any WhatsApp user can message, uh, type in a phone number and message another WhatsApp user and discover whether that phone number is associated to a WhatsApp account, service reachability. That doesn't mean they learn anything about like the internal representation of, of that phone number's account on WhatsApp. It's a separate issue, but I think we should probably focus on the service reachability. Part yeah, that's exactly, that's exactly what I meant. Yeah, and then yeah. the other thing is that um, this is, you know, whether the system has this property or not also has additional layers of discoverability control built in, i.e. if there's a provider who decides none of its users will be discoverable, that would impact the service reachability question. If there's a provider who gives their users the ability to control whether they individually are discoverable or not, that will also bear on this. So I think it'd be useful to like scope out which of those situations people are asking for or are comfortable with or not comfortable with? Like, what are your assumptions about what other controls are in place? Or are we assuming that those controls don't exist or that we want the protocol to do certain things, whether or not those controls exist? Because I feel like we're kind of running around a few of those issues. Go ahead, John. Oh, Jonathan is next. Um, I actually want to ask you a question, Alyssa, because uh, maybe it impacts my comment. Sorry. Could you, could you say again, what is the difference between service reachability and the SII to SSI mapping? Yeah. So I think service reachability is, um, as the sender, I'm able to find out if, a, if a particular phone number has an account on a service and the mapping is as a sender, I'm able to find out what the account is that's associated with a particular phone number. You mean the SSI when you say SSI. the account? Yeah. I see. So, okay. So this, this, I think there's an implied assumption here that the SSI contains some additional information that is somehow enlightening beyond the SII itself. Like to me, the main problem is the Boolean. Like, is it, is it on that account or not is, is actually a, a sensitive information. The, the SSI is like whatever, it's a UUID at provider name yes. or, or, you know, yeah, so what? Yeah, encouraging focus on the Boolean question. On the Boolean question. But I think okay. whether the identifier gets shared or not is is not. I see, I see. Issue. Okay, that, that's helpful, thank you. All right, so then then the comment I would make, which, which then I think still applies is, I think the problem is we're building a system in which we have like a fundamental contradiction. Like the, the ability to message from someone in provider A to provider B requires us to discover that provider B is the right provider, which means like this Boolean somehow needs to be communicated to the originating provider. Like there's no solution in which that doesn't happen. The problem is that mm -hmm. that is somewhat sensitive. So what we're gonna, so the problem is not to say it's private or not. The problem is we have to wrap controls and constraints on the distribution of that information. That's the thing we need to focus on. And I'm suggesting yeah. it's things like we need to build a, a system that prevents enumeration. We need to build a system that rate limits the distribution of that information based on properties. 
play main limit access. For example, I don't think any random Joe on the internet should get access to this Boolean. Uh, it, it should be a, a set of authorized messaging providers. These are the things that are actually really important to protect the privacy of this information. I completely agree with that. Um, and that, that's, that's what I was trying to say, that we should focus on methods for rate limiting and enumeration prevention. Because uh, I, I don't, I just don't know if it's practical to say. Yeah, I, I think Joe's the problem is your first sentence through everyone in a tizzy and got us all on the line. Like, it's probably not what you meant to say, but like the first sentence is, oh, this is a non-goal. And like everyone stood up and ran to the mic. It's, I, I think, <laughs> I think that's not what you mean. I think what you're saying is we can't pr completely uh, protect it. Um, it. It will get distributed. Is that, is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And um, yeah, I, I guess I'm, I'm just, I was trying to be a bit of a foil to like, we have to hide it from everybody because I don't think, I don't think that is a feasible goal. Um, but I de de definitely think that we need to wait, we, we, we need ways to prevent enumeration. Um, and that's a super important goal. So, you know, Happy to follow, follow up on that. Um, any, anybody else in the queue? I think. Yeah, yeah John is next. Oh, there's, there's, I don't know what happened. It's been so long in queue, I'm not sure how relevant <laughs> what I'm going to say is anymore. But um, yeah, I, I do think recasting this again in, in the terminology that we had uh, up on your Alyssa well, slides at the beginning of this about what the di difference between a distribution point right for this and like who the mapping authority is for this is helpful. I'm going to comment and I'm going to go back again to the example of MMS because as far as I know like this is like the is this the only example of like a cross provider S, uh, SII that is turned into SSIs at the moment right the way that it provides this property of being able to prevent you from scraping the full list of account holders is that it performs its transformation when a message is in flight. And so you have to pay the cost of sending the message in order to trigger that transformation happening. And the actual information that is used to make that transformation is actually often synthesized effectively in real time from a variety of data sources that like occur in the telephone network like while these things are happening. That's anytime we're bringing like TNs as identifiers, there is this like parade of horribles that lives behind it, but that has been that has had to confront these problems since these became, since the whole idea of sending a message to a telephone number came into existence, that I think quacks in very different ways than email addresses do. And I look at SIIs that are TN-based versus email-based as being very different beasts. And I'm sure I'll be saying this in the next presentation as well. But like, you know, those properties do exist in the platforms that actually do this. And they achieve it through things like that, like requiring the transformation to occur when the message is in flight. So like, I think there, there is a broader discussion to have about all this. Ted. Uh, Ted Hurdy, uh, I am not entirely convinced that um, we have the right properties here, even in Alyssa's uh, framing of this. I, I think Alyssa's framing is, is very, very useful, but I think there's a, uh, a point where we have to figure out uh, how the tension is going to be resolved by default. Uh, I think the, the idea that Jonathan and others have presented that there is a tension here and that there is therefore a kind of a sliding scale, not a simple Boolean is appropriate, but there has to be a default. And I strongly agree with Rowan that the current default is leakier than is appropriate for us to set. I think we have to think very carefully about whether the privacy requirement of hiding the SII to the service map mapping is an appropriate one unless the person who is asking for the mapping is in fact also disclosing something that allows uh, either the recipient um, or one of the other trusted parties uh, by the recipient to know um, that the request has been made. And I think that was strongly hinted uh, in, the, um, in the point that John 
peterson was making about the m m s case where the fact is it doesn't happen until real time and when somebody gets it what's disclosed to them about who sent it is exactly the same as what the system would use to to do re return routability um yes somebody can send me a message on one of these systems because it has a a telephone number um, associated with it, but they don't get from that who's associated with the telephone number. Trust me, I get spam on some of these systems that has nothing to do with me. There is a critical question in all of this uh, about whether or not this is a one-party or a multi-party disclosure. And I think we need somehow in the discussion of requirements to figure out whether it's a a baseline, even though there may be variation, that we presume that there, is, there needs to be two-party agreement for disclosure to occur. And if we don't have agreement about that, uh, maybe we ought to go get it, and we have agreement, and I just lost it. My apologies. Um, if I could just respond to that, I, I think the difference with, uh, with MMS here is that you need a public key before you and you need to verify that public key before you send the message. I don't think you're thinking of the same MMS then. No, he means he means in Mimi. He means in Mimi. Oh, in Mimi. That's Sorry. what he meant. Yeah. Unlike MM. Thank you. I, I... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so so I I don't I might be misunderstanding, but I don't see how you could do it in real time because the sender has to have the public key material fair but i do think we may be able to come up with a way for it to be a uh, two-party without it necessarily requiring uh two-party two agreement for disclosure even if there must be a third party that is brokering uh, the decision sorry dkg i think is yep you're last in queue and then we're going to move on to vittorio sorry yeah. we ran out of time Thanks. Um, so I, I think Ted's framing is useful, and I, I really appreciate Alyssa's uh, breakdown of, are we talking about discovering that a particular SII is on the service, that's a Boolean, um, or do I actually get the SSI? Um, but I wanted to add one additional wrinkle. We're all talking SII, and I think we're all imagining that SII really just means phone number, and we come up with a new term for it. But of course it doesn't right? An email address is also an SII. Um, and so it's conceivable that you could have one SSI that's bound to multiple SIIs. And so there's an additional piece of privacy, which is, can I now map two SIIs together hmm. by doing discovery on the two SIIs and noticing that they have the same SSI? So that's an additional wrinkle that we need to be thinking about. Like, just because someone knows my phone number, that doesn't mean they should be able to get my email address, even if I have both of them associated with my um, MLS account. Hope that made sense. That's a great point. Yes. Sorry, Giles, we're out of time. We need to switch. Um, I would invite those who have thoughts about this topic to please, like, write them up and send them to the list and or contact John and Jonathan Rosenberg, who are going to be continuing discussion on the requirements document, because um, I think we get bogged down every time we talk about this. Uh, so, <laughs> Vittorio, come on up. Okay, thank you. So I'll try to be quick and yeah, uh, there's actually two parts to this presentation um, since there are two parts to the draft. And the first one is actually about requirements, which I think is the discussion we need to have and close before actually coming to the second part, which will be about a possible DNS-based solution. But I think it's really preliminary to discuss solutions at this point in time. So next, please. And also next, please. So but basically, I think we are sort of agreeing on, on the definition of what discovery is. Uh, uh, my draft doesn't use the SSI, SSI, SII terminology, but we can adapt it. But the point I really wanted to make is that I think that the service-specific identifier really doesn't identify users. It, it only identifies accounts. 
And uh, I think it's important because th there might be multiple accounts for the same user on the same service for different purposes. And, and so we should frame this into converting one user into a set of accounts, one or more accounts. And then users might also have multiple user identifiers for different uh, contexts, but the, still the, the, the definition is the same. So next, please. So I try to define the use cases. And another thing that I, I think it would be important to do is to frame the discussion of, uh, in, in, the, in the terms that there's a user that wants other users to discover them. So it, it should be clear that it's the user that gets to be discovered that has to initiate something in general. And um, even if the initiation might be asynchronous, so they, just by publishing or, or getting an identifier. And also the other point, which is, I think, core to, to what I tried to express in the draft, is that uh, I really think we should consider also identifiers that are new and uh, that we introduce on, uh, from scratch for Mimi, and not just focus on the old ones, the, which I, I mean, the ones I call external, but I, I, by that term, I mean identifiers that come from a different service like email or the telephone number. And indeed, especially in the first phase, we will need to let users be identified by their telephone number. But uh, I think there are good reasons for also having something different. And well, the, the first reason I'll come to that, but is that uh, my, my telephone number, I mean, I've been having the same telephone number since 1999 and the same email address since 2006. And I don't want definitely everyone that has those, either the phone number or the email to, to be able to try to contact me. On, on Mimi. I might want to have something which is completely new and independent from these pieces of information which were born from something different and used in very different ways. But then, of course, there's the third case, which is when there are people that already have your phone number and might want to try to contact you. And some users, not all the users, might actually want to be contacted so to facilitate the fact that anyone having their email, their email address, for example, can contact them on Mimi. So this should be under control of the user. Uh, next slide. So I tried, I tried to come up with a list of requirements. And uh, well, I, I think there, I mean, the, the first one is the core one, it's uh, what I was talking about, is that I, I think it should really be up to the user to decide where they want to be reachable by phone numbers or email addresses. And this I mean, uh, logically implies the fact that users that don't want to be reachable by, by the old identifiers must have a way to create something new. And this gives us possibilities maybe to do something better and, and basically to skip all the problems that we now have in dealing with the privacy of phone numbers and email addresses. And uh, of course, this kind of new identifiers should be human readable and easy to use, a bit like email addresses. So uh, that's the model I was using. And, and uh, another important thing is I think that uh, also it should be possible for users to get their identifier from a provider so they don't have to think of this, they just get it and that's it. But it should also be possible for users that want to have a provider independent identifier, which means that, I mean, we now come from a model in which uh, you, you open up uh, one account for each uh, instant messaging service, one for WhatsApp, one for Telegram, and if you get sick and don't want to use WhatsApp anymore, you just close it. But we now want to transition to a model in which you only have one account possibly on one provider, and when you get sick of that provider, you move it to a different account. And this implies that you should be able to keep this, uh, the service uh, independent identifier while you move to a different provider and so to different service specific identifiers. And, this, uh, and it's important in my mind so that, that uh, this is also possible uh, by the user. So, and uh, uh, okay, so next slide. Okay, quick clarifying question. So is this yeah. entire solution predicated in the notion we're creating a new class of identifiers that are and that existing SIIs and SIs or whatever are going to be subordinate to that? Um, I don't know if I got it, but I, I, I mean, the, the, I think they should live together. So you should be able to choose whether you want to use one or the other or both. Okay, so the solution does not require that you have a new specific No, absolutely. Okay. There will be people that definitely don't want to have a new specific identifier. So next one. Uh, okay, so yeah, well, I, I think it's, well, these are pretty, simple ones. I mean, the, the, one, the one I wanted to focus on is the, the decentralization. I mean, there was some discussion on this in Pinta, and someone said, but I mean, we guarantee the, the, that there's no surveillance by encrypting everything, and I agree, of course, we should encrypt everything. But I, I think also the, if we can avoid centralized mapping systems, or however you want to call them, uh, so we can make it so that there's not a single point of failure and a central point in which all the queries can come, 
I think the, the, the privacy properties would be better. And also the, let's say the architectural properties to keep the internet distributed. And, uh, but I mean, I, I'm really trying to conceive this uh, for an environment in which people that really want to do so, and very few people might want, but some will, uh, should be able to self-host everything, their, their MIMI service and their discovery service. But again, much like email. And of course, this also implies that we should use open technologies and possibly technologies which have uh, open source implementations and are readily available and well understood. Next one. So, and then the, I, I also listed some requirements which are not technical. But again, I think it, it's important to think of these. So we have to choose something which doesn't immediately create a regulatory issue or intellectual property issues or something on, on, on the identifiers that we are going to use. And there's a reason for people to actually run it. So it's a business model in that sense. Next slide. So I, uh, next. So I, I did think, I mean, we, coming from a DNS and email company, of course I tried to see whether we could use DNS for this. And the answer is maybe. So I'm not saying we should use, I mean, I think it, it should be one of the options on the table and we should think of it. Because in the end, DNS is what is actually used for discovering basically all the main internet services today. I mean, you use DNS to discover the email provider for an email address, and you use DNS to discover the web hosting provider for a website. So, I mean, why not using the, I mean, you need also to discover your mini provider for your mini identifier, however you, you call it. And uh, I mean, and this would have the advantage that the infrastructure is there. We already know how to deal it. It's uh, really available to everyone. And, uh, of course, I mean, this works as long as the identifier is a DNS host name or maybe a URI which has a DNS host name in it. Uh, but of course, it, it's, I mean, it could be made work with uh, email addresses. Could, I mean, it's very hard to imagine to make it work for telephone numbers. So again, this could be a solution for something new if we decide that DNS is, uh, and DNS host name uh, like formats are the, the way to go. Uh, I don't think she, this would be like, the solution for the email and phone numbers so far. But so th this could live together with some of the other uh, solutions that are being presented. I don't know if we uh, take the questions now. Or... Yeah, I would take them now. We have two people. Yeah, I mean, I know we only have like three minutes left, yeah. so I'm, I guess I'm going to say two things at once, real quick. So hardly suitable for telephone numbers. And I was referring to MMS routing, not MLS, but like the stuff that actually people use in their phones. That is entirely enum-based, effectively today in the world, right? Huh. And it's not based on public enum, as you characterized in your draft, but on private enum solutions. That is actually the technology is used to resolve all of the messaging that involves telephone numbers that we're at that like actually is interdomain that's out there in the world today. I mean, the second thing I want to say, since we have so little time, I'm just anticipating your future slides, why you would define new DNS resource records for this when there are NAFTA records and SRV records and all the remainder of that. If we wanted to do it this way, surely we would do that. All the metadata parameters you want to add to it, we can simply add into NAFTA records and the things that implementations do this all the time, used to that. Yeah, I mean, let's get to the next slide. Yes, I did put a, a new MIMI record because I'm a well-behaved DNS guy, and so the, the, the DNS people say you, you should use new resource records for whatever you do. I also think that in practice this never happens. People just use TXT records, and but this is, I mean, this <laughs> all use SV, SVCB or whatever. No, they don't. They actually use the stuff I was just talking about to do this for actually routing this from SIIs today. Yeah, okay, anyway, it's, uh, I mean, this is just an example to make it, I mean, to make it clear what the kind of solution that would be. But then we, we would entirely have to discuss whether it would be an existing resource record or a new resource record or something. I mean, and whether the fields would be expressed this way or in another way. The, the point is just that you would have the identifier somewhere in the DNS and you would get from the other, I mean, a list of parameters that is everything you need to understand one or more accounts and who is managing them and uh, uh, establish a connection. And then from there, I mean, it, this, uh, it's not the scope of the draft. So, uh, but since there are concerns about, I mean, indeed some of the account names uh, you know, existing services include personal information like your name, your username, I mean, depends on the user, might not, might, uh, but, but they might. And so there, there's two alternatives. One is to, you actually put everything in the, that you need into the DNS, including the account name. So for WhatsApp, it would be your telephone number or next slide. Uh, I think we should hear from, yeah. let's hear from Kalia before we move on. No, you want to wait. Yeah, I was hearing myself to ask questions after. Okay. 
So otherwise, next slide, just to show that you can do the same thing without putting the personal information. And what would happen is like email that you then connect, I mean, the client then connects to each of the, of the desired services and, and provides the identifier and there they get the account name. And so this doesn't go through the DNS and doesn't have the privacy problems of DNS queries. So that's it. I mean, basically next slide. The, the, I think that the first question before discussing anything about this is whether we want to have this kind of uh, independent identifiers that are designed from scratch just for me for the people that don't want to use their telephone numbers and their email addresses. So, and maybe we could try to learn from the past and make them a bit more future-proof. So thank you. Clear. Um, thanks. My name is Clea Young. My handle is Identity Woman. Um, I'm just curious how much, like it feels like there's many identity things happening in the IETF, this is one of them. And there's like digital identity stuff happening outside the IETF that's some of it's connecting here, but I'm curious if you've looked at like any of the work on decentralized identifiers and because they have handy features like service endpoints and public keys associated with them, but they're not very human readable. And there's also verifiable credentials, which is like who's at the end of the endpoint and interesting things that we've, I don't know that we figured it all out, but we certainly didn't work on it, right? So how does this connect? Anyway, I'm just naming it because it feels like there's stuff we may have figured out that this community could leverage and vice versa potentially. Yeah, so the SPICE working group is one place where verifiable credential people are. No, it's not a working group. It's a BOF that may become a working group inside the ITF is working on some of this stuff. So. No, I, I agree. I mean, I think we should, first of all, agree on the requirements. And so maybe this is a discussion that we can have next. Indeed, there is stuff in the DID world that could be useful. I mean, this was meant to be, a, let's say, a focused and limited solution for a specific problem rather than something bigger. But indeed, there are like tons of identity efforts. There are actual people, people that are using host names as identifiers in several services, like I mean, Blue Sky or I mean, some, some of the blockchain-based domain names. So, so, I mean, there's a lot going on. But we can have the discussion once we decide that we are interested in at least considering it. And I think this is actually like a precursor yeah. question, That's right? Why. Like we That's don't need new identifiers potentially. So <laughs> go ahead, John, you're gonna be at the end of the queue here. Yeah, I mean, we're, I know we're over time, but since this question oh. is posed, Alan, I think you're gonna be at the end of the queue. <laughs> I think the, yeah, the, the answer is probably, probably I'm not, I think, but we're, I, I don't think we should pursue new media specific identifiers. If what you mean by that is identifiers humans are going to use. I think there are intermediate transformation right between I can imagine some places where there are privacy properties we get going from an SI, SII to an SSI with some intermediate thing, but that's hidden from the user. I think we're focused here on how to get applications that largely exist today to be able to communicate with each other with the identifiers they use, rather than defining some new meme-specific hierarchy. Uh, yeah, but there are plenty of instant messaging services that don't use uh, either email addresses or telephone numbers. So I mean, I, I think that there's already a space in which people don't want to use that. So if I don't want to use those identifiers, what do I do? How do no, can no, I use but, my... But my, well, I understand I'm not merely, again, even within Blue Sky, I agree. They use domain names within that. That's an existing identifier. I'm saying let's not the IETF go out and add a 57th to the 56 existing identifiers that messaging platforms use if we're intending these to be identifiers used by users. For, again, intermediate transformations, that may be different. Okay. All right, Alan, take us home. A little time. <laughs> yeah, Non-related non uh, to item, but uh, since it's a last session, uh, uh, I find it uh, super important. Two, two thank yous and uh, one ask. Uh, first one, of course, uh, no one said uh, thank you to Richard for a stunning uh, visual effects, uh, which I think was very unfair. I missed it this time. Uh, second thing, uh, uh, again, once more, big uh, thank you on the, the uh, design teams, uh, all of the authors uh, of uh, IDs, uh, uh, and the progress that has been done there is really fantastic, but also there comes an ask. Uh, drafts are sub being submitted way too late. If we want to have a really constructive discussions here, we need IDs to be submitted a little bit earlier. 
I know that it's a bit an unpopular uh, ask, uh, but uh, uh, we, if we want to have a constructive sessions uh, in uh, Australia, lots of us are going to be jet lagged there, reading them uh, night before the session is not going to be super helpful. So if, if everyone could please submit the ideas before we head out to Australia, there would be uh, many beers from me on that one. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, I think yeah, as, round, had we not uh, accepted any presentations from people who submitted their drafts on time, we would have had like one presentation. So um, thank you for raising that. It's a good point. Thank you, Vittorio, for presenting and see you next time. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Tim.